So good to be with you this evening. Can't tell you how happy I am to be with you, to be sharing this part of God's Word to you, and to be invited to be in your fellowship this evening. I do pray the things we study this evening are helpful to all of us, and that there are things that are able to help us grow closer to God. And as I'm sure Ron's going to say tomorrow, any and all good that comes from what we may do here this evening, glory goes to God, and it really does. And we're so glad that you're here with us. I know almost everybody. Uh, there's some faces I don't know. I've come to know most of, you, most of you over the last five years. But if I've not had a chance to meet you, please don't leave without me at least going to ch- shake your hand and say hi to you and get to know you a little better. So let's go and get into the topic for this evening. As you go into this lectureship this weekend, there's a lot of important topics, a lot of important ones. Well, Bill first emailed me a few weeks ago, I guess a few months ago now, telling me about my two topics. They were taking care of my soul and taking care of one another's soul. Two topics that can be comprehensively covered in 30 minutes. So, obviously, kidding. This is two topics we could spend a lot of time on. A lot of time on. So what I'm trying to do this evening is rather than doing an exhaustive, comprehensive study and get on every passage that the Bible talks about in reference to taking care of my soul and taking care of the souls of others, I want to look specifically at practical steps we can take to take care of my soul and then in the second half, taking care of the souls of others. John wrote in 3 John verse 2, Beloved, I pray that all may go well with you that you may be in good health as it goes well with your soul. Here John, as he was writing to his dear friend Gaius in the faith, he told him, I pray that it may go well to you and that you may be in good, essentially, physical health as it goes well with your soul. Now, we, of course, understand physical health. You ask someone, how are you doing? Oh, my back's been down recently. How are you doing? Oh, I'm doing fine. I had a cold recently. How are you doing? Typically, when we answer this, we're referring to something physical, something in our health, something perhaps emotional, something about ourselves that's more of the flesh. So now what I want to do, though, is I want to go into this question and examine the second part of this. John assumed here, and it's very interesting to note, John assumed here that his brother was going to do well. Now, he did inquire about his physical health, but he assumed because he knew so certain that his brother was doing well in the Lord. Now, we could find probably about 20 different television channels tonight at least. <laughs> infomercials, documentaries, on every, com- on every channel commercials about physical health. Last year in America alone, Marketing Enterprises estimated Americans spent $60.5 billion dollars on weight loss in 2013. $60.5 billion in weight loss last year. We could, if we wanted, spend the next 30 minutes to an hour talking about physical health, talking about how to get our bodies healthy, talking about how we prepare our bodies and we make our bodies physically fit, taking care of our bodies. As Americans in the 21st century, there's not a lot of need to talk about that. It's ubiquitous. It's everywhere. Everywhere you look, there's discussions about physical health, weight loss, getting healthy. What I want to talk about is a little bit different. Taking care of yourself. Not looking at the things of the flesh, not looking at the things that are physical, not looking at my earthly body, but looking at the things of the spirit and taking care of my soul. So here's where we're going to go this evening together. We're going to first overview what the soul is. We're going to go into scripture and we're going to define it. Second, we're going to examine the importance of it. We're going to examine the severity of the soul. Finally, we're going to look at practical steps, seeing how we can make our souls healthy, how we can take care of ourselves. Now, let me say one brief note about how we're going to use the outline. If you look through, the outlines that me and Ron and Matt gave are a little bit different. I have more of a detailed outline. Ron has more of a skeleton outline. And Matt has just a whole essay in there. I do have the sermon pretty well tailored to the outline. So if you are taking notes, feel free to take notes alongside. I, this is the first time I've ever given an outline bill. So... If you would like to type notes, it will be following along pretty well. And the PowerPoint is going to be going along with that. So if you do like to take additional notes, that's where you'll be able to do so. But enough with that. Let's get into the sermon. First of all, what is the soul? What is the soul? A basic Bible dictionary, Holman Bible dictionary, said, define the soul as the vital existence of a human being. The soul designates life. 
life. So whenever we talk about the soul, it's one of those concepts that I think most of us understand it's very important, it's something of the spirit, but if you were to actually try to tell somebody what the soul is, Holman says it's the vital existence of a human being, the essential life. Well, again, what does that mean? Whenever you talk about the vital existence of a human being, what does that mean? Well, let's let God define it for us. If you go back to Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, which we're not going to take the time to turn there, but if you go back to Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7, you read there that when God made man, he breathed life into man. One of the very first things that God did right after creation was God breathed life into man. Coincidentally enough, after the flood, God breathed life back into the world. This concept of life appears all throughout Genesis and all throughout the Old Testament. Ecclesiastes 12 and verse 7 says... And the dust returns to the earth as it was, and the soul returns to God who gave it. So whenever we talk about the soul, the Bible tells us that the soul is the breath of life. The breath of life. Back in Genesis, God breathed into man. Ecclesiastes 2, whenever we die, our soul is going to go back to God. What I want to conceptualize the soul as this evening is our breath. It is our vital existence. It's our vital existence. Have you ever tried holding your breath? I'm sure all of us did as kids or even adults. You know, you play a game to see who can hold your breath the longest. My sister and I would. She always could hold her breath longer than me. You know, trying to hold your breath. You recognize you need to breathe to live. It's essential. It's essential. That's what I'd like for us to think of the soul as. It's the breath. It's that constant spiritual component to our lives. We breathe constantly. Our soul, likewise, is that essential existence, that vital existence. It's what gives us spiritual life. Now, within Scripture, let me just say briefly, the soul is used to determine to discuss both spiritual and fleshly life. There's, there's times in which you see it used to define both. What we're going to look at this evening, though, is we're going to look at the spiritual life. We're going to look at the spiritual life. We're going to look at life of the Spirit. We're going to look at the thing that can't be seen. We're going to look at the thing that God gave back to man in Genesis chapter 2. We are going to look at that thing that when we die is going to go back to God. We're going to look at the soul. That's what I want us to examine. So whenever we talk about taking care of our soul, we're talking about taking care of our existence, taking care of our breath, taking care of our breath. My grandmother, whenever, right before she passed, she had awful breathing problems. Awful breathing problems. She eventually had to put an oxygen on. They had to put oxygen on her to help her to breathe. And as I would try to listen to her breathe, you could hear her wheezing every breath, just gasping for every little bit of oxygen she could. You ever heard someone breathe like that? I don't breathe like that. I have a very natural breath. How do I breathe? How's our soul? My grandmother, her breathing was horrible. Her physical body was horrible. What I'd like for us to begin to examine and what we're going to keep on looking at is how is our breath? Is our breath normal? Is it healthy? Is it solid? Or do we gasp for breath? Is it pitiful? Is it weak? How's our breathing? How's our soul? Now, when we begin to talk about the soul, then the next thing we need to examine is, why take care of it? Why take care of it? I mean, Ryan, you're going to spend a whole 30, 45 minutes talking about why to take, about how to take care of the soul. I want to examine briefly why should we take care of the soul. Back in Ezekiel chapter 18, Ezekiel chapter 18, beginning in verse 1, the prophet Ezekiel prophesied sometime after the fall of Israel, but really before the fall of Jerusalem, from best we can tell. Ezekiel was a very dynamic, interesting prophet. Lots of really interesting stories in there. But we're going to examine Ezekiel in both hours. We're going to examine Ezekiel first this evening to look at individual responsibility. Then we're going to look at him a little bit later talking about collective responsibility. But one interesting part of Ezekiel is that he tells the people that in order for you to prevent, 
In order for you to avoid the coming captivity, the coming destruction, you're going to have to watch out for yourselves first. So, Ezekiel 18, verse 1. Ezekiel 18, verse 1. The word of Yahweh came to me. What do you mean by repeating this proverb concerning the land of Israel? The fathers have eaten sour grapes, and the children's teeth are set on edge. As I live, declares the Lord God, this proverb shall be no more by you in Israel. Behold, all souls are mine. The soul of the Father as well as the soul of the Son is mine. The soul who sins shall die. Now, within the immediate context, really what Ezekiel is talking about is captivity. If you do not turn away from your sins, if you do not turn away from your evil and from all the wicked things that you're doing, those souls are going to die. The same, however, is true with us. The same is exactly true with us. If we go and contrast this with 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 8, keep your finger marked with me in Ezekiel 18 because we are going to go back there. But if you look with me in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 8, can we read the opposite? So, again, why take care of the soul? First of all, if we don't, we're going to die an eternal death, an eternal captivity, an eternal life away from the Father who is the giver of life. The giver of life. When you think, talk, think about it. God is the giver of life. God is the giver of life. And to spend an eternity away from the giver of life. That's what's going to happen if we don't take care of our souls. To the one who gave breath into Adam, the one who gave breath into Eve, the one who gives breath to each and every one of us, the one who gives us our life. If we don't take care of our souls, we run the risk of spending an eternity away from that giver. It's beyond my comprehension. But I know very certainly, if we do not watch for our souls and take very good care of them, we run the risk and we run the very, very real life scenario that we are going to live eternity away from God. But, 1 Peter 1 and verse 8. Though you not seen Him, you love Him. Though you do not see Him now, you believe in Him and rejoice with a joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory. Obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. So here's the two options. They're very clear. First, the soul who sins shall die. Second, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. The salvation of your essential life, of your breath. So why should we take care of our souls? Again, we know this. We it's common sense to us. But I, not, I want God's Word to remind us of this before we start dealing with any practical steps. Why take care of our souls? Because there's two options. First, the soul who sins shall die. Second, the soul who's healthy, the soul that lives well, is going to receive an eternal inheritance in heaven. When I think about my grandmother again, her wheezing, her horrible, terrible, pitiful breath, it made her life uncomfortable for a little while. And she surely had a hard time breathing. And it really hurt her. But then when I apply that to my spiritual life, when I see the pain that my grandmother went through because she couldn't breathe, when I think about how she would just gasp for every little bit of oxygen that she could get inside of her lungs, it was painful for her. It was painful. And then when I think how healthy I am, how natural my breath is, it reminds me the same is infinitesimally more true when we apply this to the spiritual realm. A physical strong breath leads to a happy good life. A weak, pitiful breath makes one utterly miserable. It's the same with the soul. If our spiritual breath is weak, it's ultimately going to lead to death. If, however, our breath is strong, if our breath is nourished by God, if our breath is truly taken care of, we are going to get the outcome of our faith, the salvation of our souls. So here's what we've done so far. We have first established what the soul is. The soul is the essential life. It is life. It is breath. What we've also established is why take care of our souls. Two reasons. First, take care of your soul. You'll receive an eternal inheritance. Second, don't take care of your soul. You're going to die. Only two options there are. Now let's get a little more practical. Let's get a little more practical. 
When we look at the responsibility for the soul, if you'll turn back with me to Ezekiel chapter 18. Ezekiel chapter 18, if you'll turn back there with me. When I look at my grandmother, she really didn't have a lot of control over her breath. She had asthma. At that point in her life, there was really nothing she could do to help herself except take oxygen. But the reason she got asthma was she smoked for years. She smoked for years. And as she became more mature, as she, she, of course, grew out of the smoking stage, she recognized how horrible of a mistake it was. And she regretted every cigarette she'd ever had. But the reason she had a hard time breathing, it's ultimately because she didn't take care of her physical body well enough. She, she would admit it to you, it was her fault. It was her fault. It wasn't because of her husband's fault. It wasn't because of my fault. It wasn't because of her children's fault. The reason ultimately she had a hard time breathing was because of her own fault. Whose responsibility is my soul? Whose responsibility is my soul? Read with me Ezekiel 18, verse 20. Ezekiel 18, beginning, actually I'm going to start in verse 19. Ezekiel 18, 19. Yet you say, why should not the Son suffer the iniquity of the Father? When the Son has done what is just and right and has been careful to observe all my statues, he shall certainly live. So let's stop there for a second. The point Ezekiel is making here is the Son and the Father must be viewed separately. The Son, who has done what is right and just and been careful to observe all my statues, he shall surely live. But, verse 20, the soul who sins shall die. The Son shall not suffer for the iniquity of the Father, nor the Father suffer for the iniquity of the Son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon himself, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon himself. Brethren, we must take very, very close attention to this passage. My soul is my responsibility. Period. My soul is my responsibility. My grandmother's asthma was her fault. It was her responsibility. She was responsible for her health. And because she didn't take care of it like she should have, she eventually got asthma and had a hard time breathing. Likewise, when she was healthy, and when any of us are healthy, whose responsibility is it to take care of my physical body? It's mine, isn't it? I weigh a few more pounds than I'd like to. You know whose fault that is? It's mine. It's mine. It's not my wife's. It's not my parents'. It's my responsibility. When we look at our own spiritual state, whose ultimate responsibility is it? It's mine. If I'm not doing as well as I want spiritually, it's not my fault. Oh, it is. We must take personal responsibility for ourselves. So when we talk about the soul, the reason we need to take care of them is ultimately, I'm going to be the one to die or I'm going to be the one to get an eternal life. But Ezekiel points out very clearly to the children of Israel, the responsibility and the severity of your soul, it falls upon yourself. It falls upon yourself. So then, how then do we take care of it? How then do we take care of it? It's my responsibility. It's my breath. It's my life. Ultimately, it's going to lead to heaven or it's going to lead to hell. How do I take care of it? Well, when we think about physical health, I'm going to use quite a few different metaphors this evening referring to physical health. There's both reactive health and proactive health. Now, I'm going to reverse them. We're going to look at reactive health first. And then we're going to live with proactive health. I have a reason for it, though. So when we talk about reactive health, this is whenever you've already gotten sick. You've already gotten sick, so you have to react. You've already gotten cancer, so you have to respond to it. You've already had a heart attack, so you have to change your diet. You've already had a stroke, so you have to change perhaps smoking or other aspects of your life. You've already gotten diabetes, so you have to change your eating habit. You've already gotten sick, and you have to change something in your life. This is reactive health. Reactive health. Sadly, this is what all of us in here have had to do at some point or another in our souls. Because whenever we look at ourselves, we must first realize all of us have sinned. Jeremiah pointed out many centuries ago, is there no bomb in Gilead? Is there no physician there? Why did Jeremiah call out for this, this bomb? It was an ancient remedy. 
Gilead had this ancient remedy that was said to be able to cure so many sicknesses. He cried out when he looked at the sins of his people. And he cried out to God and said, Is there no bomb in Gilead? Is there no physician there? Because when he looked at the spiritual sickness of his people, he longed for a cure. He longed for a cure. I've sinned. I've sinned before my God. I've transgressed against Him. I've gone against His holy word. I have fallen from glory. Because I, my soul is sick, because my spiritual soul has been made sinful, because I myself have sinned, because I am responsible for the sins I've done, I have to cry out the same thing to God. God, where's the physician for me? God, I've sinned against you. God, my soul is sick. God, my spiritual breath is being quenched out by you. And I need God for you to come. And I need for that breath that I can barely take anymore. I need you to restore my breath. It's my fault that my breath is like this. It's my fault that I'm having a hard time with my spiritual life. God, can you send me a physician? And can you make my soul better? God gave us a physician. Matthew 9. Go with me to Matthew chapter 9. Matthew chapter 9, a beautiful story from Jesus. One of his early stories, but it tells us so much about the character and the purpose of Christ. Matthew 9, beginning in verse 9. And Jesus passed on from there. He saw a man called Matthew sitting from the tax booth. And he said to him, follow me. And he rose and followed him. And as Jesus reclined at table in the house, behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and were reclining with Jesus and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? But we've heard it, and he said, Those who are well have no need of physician, but those who are sick. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. For I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. Christ is the physician. We sing the song, The Great Physician, that terms aren't found in Scripture. But it's a great song, a great song with a good meaning. When we ourselves have gotten sick, when our breath is quenched out by sin, when our, physic, when our spiritual life has been made ill and has been become sick by the illnesses of sin, we must cry out to God, is there a physician? There is. And how do we come into contact with this physician? Galatians 3 verse 27 tells us, For as many of you who were baptized into Christ to put yourselves in Christ. Galatians 3 27, Romans 6. Only two passages in Scripture that tell us how to get to Christ. They both relate to baptism. If you want that physician, you have to go to him. I know when you're get a sinus infection, I have to go to the doctor. I hate it as much as anything. But I have to go to the doctor. The doctor's not coming to me. The doctor's not coming to me. Do you know what's beautiful? Jesus came to us. You hear about the old time home doctors, doctors who come around to the homes? That's Jesus Christ. That's Jesus Christ. He left heaven and he came down here for us. I knew my physician for 18 years growing up. I had the same doctor 18 years growing up. You know how many times he came by my house when I was sick? Not a one. He was a great doctor. He was good to my family and he was a good doctor. But he did not make one house call. Jesus Christ came down and he came down to this earth and he made a house call. And brothers and sisters, all that we have to do, all that we have to do is render ourselves over in the waters of baptism, be baptized into Jesus Christ, be immersed into him, and we've gotten the healing blood of the physician. We've gotten the healing power of Jesus. We've gotten the cleansing power that comes through His grace. What we must do, we must go to Him. So here's the first question we really have to ask ourselves practically. Am I sick? <coughs> Am I sick? Typically, I don't go to the doctor till I'm sick. I don't like going to the doctor, I'll admit it. I do not like going to the doctor. But whenever I get sick, you know what I do? I'm reactive. I'm reactive to my sickness and I go to the doctor. <coughs> It's the same with our souls. If our souls have been made sick, if our breath is weak, if our spiritual life is being quenched out by sin, we must be reactive. And we must go to Jesus. I have up here, without Him, the breath of life is made for sin. The 
breath of life is vanquished with sin. When I compare the life of my grandmother when she was able to breathe really well, when she had that strong breath, we had such good memories. But then whenever I think about how sick she got, and I think about how little we were able to talk, how little we were able to do, reminds me of the ramifications that come when your breath is taken out. It's the same as infinitesimally more true with our soul. If our soul is healthy, if it's strong, we can find meaning, we can find purpose in Jesus. If, however, sin has come into our lives and has taken it away, we must go to the physician and we must let him cure us. We must let him cure us. Now let's talk about proactive soul health. Proactive soul health. When we look at what it means to be healthy physically, there's numerous diets. There's numerous diets. If I were to ask each person in here, give me an ideal diet, I'd probably get at least 10 different answers. I would probably get one answer telling me low carbs. I'd get another answer telling me low fat. I get another one telling me, well, cholesterol is really what you have to watch. I get another answer telling me, well, just simple sugars are all you have to watch. I get probably six other answers I don't even know about yet. When we talk about what it means to be physically healthy, there's all types of ideas, there's all types of diets. And I'll admit to you, I have no earthly clue who to go to to get the right diet. <laughs> I have no idea. Every doctor I read who has some diet plan, they claim to be the world's chief expert, and they claim to know exactly what I need to do to have the perfect diet. I don't know. If you were asking me what it means to be the perfect diet, I obviously don't know, and I wish you'd tell me. I don't know. I do know, however, where we can find the correct spiritual diet. It's in the Word of God. Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12. Hebrews 4 and verse 12. So in summary so far, my soul is my responsibility. My soul is my responsibility. Whenever I have gotten a sick soul, when my breath becomes weak, whenever sin enters into my life, I must go to Jesus. I must be baptized, immersed into Him, and He can take away my soul. And he, excuse me, he can take away my sins. He can take away my sins. But, I think all of us would likewise agree, it's nice to have a healthy life. It's nice to be able to not be sick. It's nice to be able to have a healthy, good, fervent life. When you're able to run, whenever you're able to have energy, whenever you're able to feel good, it's a wonderful thing. Now, that doesn't come just by reactive health. It takes proactive health. It takes eating the right things. It takes exercising correctly. It requires taking care of your body. However, there's chaos in the world. We don't know exactly how to take care of the physical body, but Hebrews 4 verse 12 tells us, For the Word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing the division of soul and of spirit, of joint and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. I cannot tell you the perfect human diet. I can't do it. But I can tell you the perfect spiritual diet. It's found in the Word of God. It's found in the Word of God. Whenever I think about the chaos that comes in this world because of lack of knowledge with physical things, God's Word takes away all the chaos whenever it comes to a spiritual diet. This Scripture tells us here that the Word of God, this Scripture, this ancient book, it is living and it's active. It is sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing the division of soul and spirit. Of soul and spirit. Discerning the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. If we want to find the perfect spiritual diet, we need to go to this book. We need to go to this book. If we want to know how to take care of our souls, if we want to know how to take care of our life, if we want to know how to take care of our spiritual dread breath, we have to go to this book. Now, let me tell you, I have this a little bit later, but let me tell you up front. What I'm about to say is going to be very common sense. Very common sense. I truly doubt I'm in the next five, ten minutes going to say anything that's new. But let me also say this about physical health. I don't know the perfect physical diet. I don't know it. I do know if I want to lose weight and get healthy, I have to eat right and exercise. 
He liked exercise. I know I don't wake up every morning and eat a cup full of lard and a donut and then have 12 sweet teas. Oh, that sounds good for lunch. And then I go home and have, you know, a fried chicken every night, green beans, just all kind of bacon grease on them. Then I put all types of sugar in my carrots. I know full and well. If I want to get healthy, that's not what I need to do. I need to eat right, eat less sugar, eat more grains, eat my vegetables. And I need to exercise a little more. It's very common sense. I would like to suggest the same is true with our souls. I'm not going to present anything here this evening that you're going to walk away from me. Oh, Ryan, I've never thought of that. I've never thought of it. I'm guessing everyone in here knew this evening. If I want to get healthier, if I want to lose weight, eat right and exercise. Common sense. The same is true with our souls, but how exactly do we do it? How exactly do we do it? First, go with me again back to Ezekiel chapter 18. Ezekiel chapter 18. Ezekiel chapter 18. Here are some practical solutions, some practical steps that Ezekiel gave to the children of Israel, telling them how they were to take care of their souls. Now remember with me back up in verse 20. Ezekiel told them it is your responsibility to take care of your soul. It's your responsibility. God through Ezekiel didn't just tell the people, all right, don't sin, take care of your souls. He told them how, verse 20. But if a wicked person turns away from all of his sins that he has committed and keeps all my statutes and does what, does what is just and right, he shall surely live. He shall not die. God had just a couple sentences only to tell them. The soul who sins shall die. Here he tells them, if you turn away from your sins, and keep my God's statutes, do what is right, then you'll live. Then you'll live. Then your spiritual breath will be brought back into you. Then the spiritual vitality that you once had, it'll come back into you. If, three things, turn away from the sins, keep the statutes of God, and do what is just and right. Brothers and sisters and ladies and gentlemen, the same is true with us. If we want to take care of our souls, what do we have to do? Turn from our sins, keep God's statutes, doing what is just and what is right. That's what God tells us to do. Let's go to Romans 2 as well. Romans chapter 2. Here God has given us even more help. He's given us even more help through His Word. Romans chapter 2 and verse 8. Romans 2 and verse 8. Here we read. Excuse me, 8 2. Romans 8 and verse 2. I'm getting my verses mixed up. Romans 8 and verse 2. Beginning in verse 2, we read <clears throat> For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Jesus Christ from the law of sin and death. For God has done, the, for God, for God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. By sending his own Son in the likeness of the sinful flesh for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk according to the, not according to the flesh but according to the Spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh but those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it is not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If, in fact, the Spirit of God dwells in you, anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong in Him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, and the Spirit is life because of righteousness... It is spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. He who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. In order to take care of our souls, our minds must turn away from the things of the flesh. Our minds must turn away from the things that are sinful. Our minds must turn away from the things that are wicked. Our minds must turn away from the things of Satan. Our minds must turn toward the things of the Spirit. 
toward the things of God, toward the things that are holy, toward the things that His Word tells us. And did you notice there in verse 11? If the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, He who raised Jesus Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you. God is on our side. God is on our side. How hard is it to lose weight? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Don't even answer that question, do we? It's hard. It's hard. I know it is. I know it is. One of the most reassuring thoughts that I came across in this study is that God is with me and He's helping me. God is helping me take care of myself. God didn't just put us down here on earth, step back, and say, Ryan, good luck. God's with us, brothers and sisters. If we seek His Word, if we seek to do what is right, if we seek to live according to His statutes, God in His providence is helping us. He's helping us. God wants us to get to heaven. God wants us to be well. God wants us to breathe. God wants us to have a strong breath. God wants our souls to be well. And He's helping us. He's helping us. Now, I don't know all the details and all the reasons, but brothers and sisters, I know God in His providence is watching over me. God in His providence is watching over me and He's helping me. And I must take care of my soul again. My soul is my responsibility. If my soul is sick, if my breathing is weak, if my soul is not well, we can't blame God. I can't tell you the number of people I've met who struggle with this sin and they blame God for it. I know a brother down at Florida College who had struggled with purity of mind for years and years. Do you know who he blamed? He blamed God. He blamed God for his own soul's sickness. God wants our souls to be well. God wants us to have a strong breath. My soul is sick. It's my responsibility. God even gave us His own Son to help our souls be well. Amen. And brothers and sisters, if we want our souls to be well, all we have to do is read His Word and do it. And that old song tells us, trust and obey. It's that easy. If we want to lose weight, yeah, it may be difficult because of my willpower, but I need to eat wet, right down and exercise. I need to stop watching 30 minutes of television and get outside and run. I need to stop eating all this nastiness, all this McDonald's and Chick-fil-A and all Chick-fil-A. Oh, I need to keep on. That's what I need to stop doing. You know what I need to do, though? The same is true with our souls. God wants our souls to be well. He wants our souls to be healthy. I have to stop doing the things that are evil. I have to stop doing the things of the flesh and I have to do the things of the Spirit. Do the things of the Spirit. So that then begs the question. If we can get this to work. Bill, did I maybe turn it off? Trying to, trying to change slides. It's not working? No, sir. Trying the arrows. That would make sense, wouldn't it? There we go. Brotherly kindness right there. All right. So, that that's not working either. <laughs> that's not working either. Take the, take the little we'll move it between it. We don't need it. We don't need it. All right. We've established so far. Here's what we've established. My soul is my responsibility. If I don't take care of my soul, my soul's going to die. If I do take care of my soul, I'm going to have an eternal inheritance with God. Why do I take care of it? For those reasons. It's my responsibility and I must do it. How do I do it? I read the Word. I go to the great source of the spiritual diet. I read it and I do it. It's that simple. It's that simple. But now that also begs the question. How then do we know if we're doing well spiritually? Be kind with me to Galatians 5. Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. It's pretty easy to tell how my body is. You know, I can measure body fat. I can measure BMI. 
I can measure my cholesterol, my blood sugar. There's various physical metrics we can use to see how well our bodies are doing. It's a little bit though more difficult, to me at least, to know how my soul's doing. Because I can't just go to the doctor and say, what's my BMI, what's my cholesterol, what's my blood sugar? Okay, thanks. So how do we know? How do we know if our soul's doing well, if we have a strong breath, or if we have a weak breath and our soul's not doing well? Galatians 5, beginning in verse 19. For the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. How many of those apply to your life? Verse 22. For the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. If I were to sit down and tell you whether I do more of the things that are the works of the flesh or I do more of the things that are the fruits of the Spirit, how would I do Seriously, if you after you left here were to go down and just tally, how do I do in the forks of the flesh versus how I do with the works of the Spirit? That's an awful good indicator of how good your soul is. It's a fruit of the Spirit. A fruit of the Spirit. Something that's spiritual. If the Spirit is doing well, it is naturally going to produce these things. If your body is doing well, you're going to have a good... You're going to have a good body fat and low body fat number. You're going to have a good muscle mass. You're going to have a good cholesterol. You're going to have a low blood sugar. You're going to have all these things. They're a part of a good health, right? It's like what's with our soul. If my soul is doing well, I'm going to have love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. These will be the things of my life. These are our measurement. If we want to give it a spiritual scale, and we want to look down at that scale and see how well we're doing. Here it is. Here it is. How am I doing? Go with me also to Colossians 3. It has another similar list. Colossians chapter 3. Here we have two different lists. Beginning in verse 8. Colossians 3 and verse 8. But now you must put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and unseen talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge after the image of its creator. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, obscene talk, up to verse 5. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, covetousness, which is idolatry. So there's our first list. There's our first list. Down to verse 12. Here's our second list. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another, and if one another is complaining against another, forgiving one another. Again, if I were to sit down and tally the works of the flesh, the things of the earth, Versus the things of the Spirit, the fruits of the Spirit, the effects of this life, the things of the new man. How would I do? How would I do? I know if I look down at the scale and it's too high, right? You need to lose a few pounds. You need to eat right, you need to exercise, and you need to lose a few pounds. If I look at this list, and I'm doing the things of the flesh. If I look at this list and I'm doing the things of Satan, I need to take better care of myself. It means my spiritual breath is weak. It means I can barely breathe. It means that just as much pain as my grandmother was in whenever she could barely even muster a breath. That's what my soul looks like. That's what my soul looks like. But if I can read this list and I see that I'm doing many of the things that Paul mentions in these lists, that I'm kind, loving, compassionate, forgiving, I can look down at that scale and I can know that by the grace of God, 
My soul's okay. My soul's okay. So brothers and sisters, here's the question of the hour. How's your soul? How's your soul? How's your breath? So tonight in our first hour, here's what we've established. We've established the soul is one's spiritual breath. It's one's life. The soul is the most important thing in this life, resulting in either eternal heaven or eternal hell. The condition and the vitality of my soul is my responsibility. If it's not doing well, I need to take better care of it. I need to go into God's work, and I need to do it. Just like you have to eat right and exercise, you've got to read the Word and do it. And then after we've done that, we need to go to these verses and others. And we need to look to see, how am I doing? I need to measure myself. I need to get on that spiritual scale and see, how am I doing? How am I doing? Thank you so much for your kind attention. We'll take about a 10 minute break. Take about a 10 minute break and then we'll come back together. Sometimes it just freezes. Oh, it's fine. Sometimes.